Hello everyone, thank you for clicking on the Literacy Volunteers of Harrison County YouTube channel. We're a nonprofit United Way agency and we provide these videos to you free of charge to use for educational purposes. If you like our channel, please click on the subscribe button below and you can subscribe. If you click on the little bell icon, it will notify you whenever we put up new videos. Today I'm continuing on with my Biology 101 series. Um, today I have two lessons for you. The first one is lesson number eight on equilibrium and homeostasis. So we've gone through three of the top five subjects of biology. Now we're on the fourth one and it, it is equilibrium and homeostasis. Homeostasis is the state of the body or a cell where there is stability within its internal environment. And this is a dynamic process. This is what we want to go on. We want to maintain stability so that everything is working in conjunction and working well. Equilibrium is a state of balance within a system. So they've given us an example here. Uh, when you sweat to cool off your body and you return it back down to that 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit, then um, as, because as you exercise your, your body temperature increases, the sweat is used to cool your body down and we're going to look at that here in a little bit. And then that would bring it back to the 98.6. Um, now everyone's not going to be at 98.6. That's just sort of like a benchmark number they give you to whatever your set point is. And we're going to look at a set point here in a minute. So steady state is a, also a dynamic process. It's called dynamic equilibrium. And so when we look at homeostasis, that's the whole internal environment. The steady, steady state is restricted to specific mechanisms within that environment. So we have this cell and it's in homeostasis. And the reason it stays in homeostasis because every single mechanism that works within that cell keeps it alive in that steady state. Whether we're talking about glycolysis or the Krebs cycle or electron transport chain. Any of those things that occur within that cell help to maintain the homeostasis or the steady state of the cell. The goal of homeostasis is to maintain that equilibrium. We want to be equal. You don't want, once things go out of whack, then that throws the whole system off and we have to come back to homeostasis. So a change in the internal or external environment of a cell or an organism is called a stimulus. So we're going to um, change something about this organism as a stimulus and that stimulus is detected by what's called a receptor. So say you were standing and you accidentally put your hand down on a hot stove, right? The change in the in environment is that hot stove, the heat, and then you have receptors in your hand. We're going to look at what happens when we um, pair those two together. So the receptor will signal or sense that change right in the environment will sense that stimulus and it's going to signal the control center that's your brain it sends a signal there and that generates a response and that's called an effector so you put your hand on the hot stove it, you sense the internal environment, that's your stimulus, and then you send, a message goes to your brain that says, hey, you better move your hand off of the hot stove, goes back down to a, a muscle that will help you to move your hand. And it happens instantaneously, but that's the process by which it happens. The effector is usually a muscle, like I just said, to move your hand, or a gland. So the muscle, um, they will contract or relax depending on what the stimulus is and a gland secretes hormones right gland secrete hormones so the body will usually attempt to go back to that homeostatic set, set point whenever it's disturbed so that's an outward disturbance there can be inward disturbances as well right in your body so um, we're going to look at what are called feedback loops. There are two types of feedback loops. The first one, homeostasis is maintained by a negative feedback loop. And the second one is a positive feedback loop. And what that usually does is push the organism further out of homeostasis, but we need those in order for life to occur. These are controlled by the nervous system, right? That's your nerves. We looked at those way back when we looked at anatomy. And the endocrine system, that's the hormones and the glands that we're talking about. That's your endocrine system. So let's look first at a negative feedback loop, okay? So it is a homeostatic process. It changes the direction of the stimulus. The stimulus, remember, was that change. So it can increase or it can decrease a stimulus, but the receptor is not allowed to continue as it did before the receptor sensed it. So we're changing the receptor upon sense of the stimulus. 
Um, if the level is too high, the body will respond and bring it down. If the level is too low, the body will respond and bring it back up. Remember, we want to be equilibrium. So this is just an example. We'll just use this one. This is our, our pizza. So say we have pizza, we're hungry. We're going to eat this pizza. Once we consume this food and start the process of digestion, your blood glucose levels will rise. The sugar in your blood starts to rise from the eating of this carbohydrate, correct? So in turn, once that happens, in response to those high glucose levels, your pancreas is gonna secrete insulin into your blood. So the pancreas, right, is that receptor, right? Because the stimulus is us eating, the glucose in our blood stimulates the receptor. Remember we talked about receptors are either muscles or glands. Pancreas is gonna release a hormone, insulin into your blood. In response to that, once that insulin's in your blood, once we have those higher insulin levels, all of this glucose is gonna be transported into your cells and into your liver cells, right? Once it gets to your liver, your liver's gonna store it in a form called glycogen. And glycogen, once we have that there in the liver and these cells are full of glucose, it's no longer in the blood. So your blood glucose levels go down right? So once your blood glucose levels go down, your body says, hey, why are my blood glucose levels down? It says we have a lower concentration of glucose. So that's going to send a, a message to the, ins to the pancreas to stop producing insulin, right? So this is a, a feedback loop. Sort of like if you're sitting in your house and you get really cold and you go over and you turn the thermostat down. Once you put it on 70, when it gets to 70, it turns off, right? What happens when your house drops below 70 degrees? It turns back on. It's a negative feedback loop, right? So that's what this is. This is a, a negative feedback loop. So let's look at a positive feedback loop. This one is a positive feedback loop and it's going to maintain the direction of our stimulus. In this instance, stimulus, response, lack of stimulus. Stimulus, response, less stimulus. In this instance, we're going to increase the direction of our stimulus. And sometimes it'll accelerate it. This, is my, my drawing isn't too good, but bear with me. This is the uterus, and here's the cervix, and this is our little um, baby in the uterus, and here's the umbilical cord, right, here attached to the placenta. So what happens is the baby during labor starts to push against the cervix, right? And the cervix starts to stretch out. Well, that's going to send a signal once that cervix starts to stretch, it sends the signal to uh, um, nerve impulses to the brain, right? So here we have this um, baby's head pushing on the cervix, stretch, the signal goes to the brain and the brain stimulates this little gland called the pituitary and it secretes this hormone called oxytocin. So once we get the secretion of this oxytocin, the oxytocin is going to cause this uterus to contract. And instead of, once it contracts, stopping the contractions, because that would be negative, it's positive. So instead of that, it's going to keep causing it to contract and contract and contract. And we get more oxytocin sent from the brain to the pituitary. More oxytocin, more oxytocin, more oxytocin, till the baby is born, right? So instead of lowering the oxytocin and causing your pain to subside, in our positive feedback loop, we're going to get more and more oxytocin until the contractions are powerful enough to cause childbirth. That's a positive feedback loop. So can we adjust systems at a set point? And the answer is yes, we can. The feedback loop will work to maintain the newest set point. So this is, um, say your set point, we're looking here at blood pressure, right? Your blood pressure over time, say now 120 over 80 of a normal blood pressure, right? That's the set point. But what your body will do, it will increase this set point if we have a continued increase in blood pressure. So say day after day after day after day, your blood pressure is 130 over 90. It's going to move your set point from 120 over 80 to 130 over 90. Your body, to maintain homeostasis, that's what it's going to do. So the body no longer recognizes the elevation as abnormal. It says this is normal blood pressure now because we've reset our set point to reach equilibrium and it's not going to try to lower it. It's not going to try to bring it back down. And the only way you can do that is take medication. This can be harmful, right, if you have a, a higher blood pressure or a lower blood pressure. So we take the medication, it decreases our blood pressure. Once your body senses that, it will lower the set point in the system. This is called the alteration of a feedback loop. 
We've changed that feedback loop. We've reset the set point. Sometimes changes can be made in a group of body or organ systems in order to maintain a set point, and that's called acclimatization. We have a couple examples of that, just without what we'll say we'll move away from the human body. We'll look at birds. When we have birds or any animal that I, uh, migrates to higher altitudes, at higher altitudes, the oxygen level isn't as, as heavy or isn't as thick as it is here, right? When you go up in elevation, oxygen depletes. So in order to adjust, their bodies will increase the number of red blood cells because red blood cells carry oxygen. And so what, due to the lower oxygen levels, so that ensures that now we get an adequate amount of oxygen delivery to the tissues. You have a lot of those people who um, want to climb Mount Everest. So they go up to base camp and they let their bodies acclimatize you know, even though they're using oxygen, to that level because your red blood cell level has to increase so much to bring more oxygen to your body. They have these little people Sherpas that help people that don't even need oxygen because they've lived at that so long that their body's constantly producing all that extra oxygen for the higher altitudes. And that's sometimes how you can get altitude sickness, right? If you get um, that, that can happen as well. So, and then the second example, sometimes, especially around here, animals will get heavier coats in the winter. Well, they, in the summer, they don't need all that extra heat, but then they'll shed those summer coats and get heavier coats in the winter to acclimatize to retain heat, to keep their bodies warm. So when we're talking about homeostasis and equilibrium, we always want to be at that set point. Any external, internal change in your body, it's going to try to move it back to that set point. And we're also looking at negative, positive feedback loops. So we would like for you to um, like this video, to view it, share it with your friends, and subscribe to our channel. Um, please give it a thumbs up and check out the next one on thermoregulation.